It's a shame we couldn't find an epic bumper for this one. Um, Welcome to the movies. It is great to be here. We are so excited about what God is doing in our midst and the ways that God is leading and nurturing and nudging and convicting and moving in in this place. It's been an amazing morning already. Do you just want to give thanks to God for this amazing band that leads us so well? Micah and the team do such an extraordinary job of carrying us into the presence of God. And, and, and there's something he said there at the end. He said, y'all, this is your song. And, and one of my favorite things that happens in worship services is when, frankly, those that are up front get out of the way and let us, us move in closer. There's no veil between. There's no place between that we, we come right into that holy of holies in the presence of Almighty God. And so today as we begin a new sermon series, we're going to be talking about the ships of the Bible. No, it's not the ships there. Mark's picking up on that in a great way. Uh, this theme this, the, of ships. And today I'm going to be focusing on membership and why uh, membership is so important in scripture and why membership is so important in our lives. And so we're going to unpack three things related to membership membership uh, and then we'll go into some of the other ships over the coming weeks but this says we planned about a year ago we started dreaming about that this series that would lead up to basically right up to uh, and right before uh, we get to Thanksgiving and then move into Advent together and so excited about where we're going to be going with that as well uh, this this series is all about how we are called to embody what it means this very first message to be in membership in relationship in this organism this living body of Christ, uh, our, our living hope. And, and, and this thought has been running over me um, this week, and that is that the, the beauty of who Christ is, is that Jesus put on flesh, bodily form came to live among us. God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, spirit form, Jesus put on flesh and walked in our midst and walked into our lives, walked into our world so that he might show us and love us and model for us what it means to be a part of what God is doing in the world. Today, friends, every time a person is baptized, every time a person professes faith and comes into a relationship with Christ, every time we receive his body in communion and his blood, that we become a part of that body. We, we become his body today, his hands, his feet, his eyes, his ears, his mouth, his nose, and, and other parts uh, of that body. And so today, uh, I want to give a welcome to all of you who are gathered here in the room for worship. I want to give a welcome to all of you who are gathered with us in the online campus. I've gotten texts and messages this morning from many of you as well. And we are so thrilled. Wherever you're worshiping with us from, whether that be in the room or other countries around the globe. We're grateful to have you here. Today we're going to be unpacking Romans 12 verses 1 through 8 and we're really going to be living around this idea. Membership brings privileges and priorities. Membership brings privileges and priorities. We're going to begin with chapter 12 verse 1. I'm going to invite you to stand for the reading and hearing of God's most precious and holy word. For those in the room, for those of you online, find the posture that best helps you to hear and receive and process what God would speak to us today. Hear the word of God. I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by grace given me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned." For as in one body, we have many members and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving The one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. 
Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful, slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. Amen. You may be seated. So somewhere around 150 to 200 times in the last eight days, I've been asked to say, what happened to you? I smile different. I look like a good Southern boy. I've heard over and over, you got dip in and it's uh, all kind of different things there. So I'm going to tell you this story and you can help tell the story to others. So a week ago, last Saturday, yesterday, we had our church work day. We were out here working on the grounds. We had people working on the creek banks and the fence line and the prayer garden and the flower beds. And and then there were three of us that decided we had a a storm about three months ago that knocked down the biggest branch on the biggest and oldest tree on our beautiful property here, our 52 acres with three quarters of a mile of interstate frontage here at 8051 Glen Road. And so we have not had the children playing out in our favorite place where we do outdoor worship. Uh, you, you know, there's this giant tree out there and this huge 30, 40 foot long branch in the storm got broken. It didn't fall all the way to the ground, but it broken, uh, broken and at an angle went to the ground. One part attached to the tree and the end of it broken off and leaning down to the ground. So we've not allowed the children to be out there because of the danger of something that big. We didn't want anyone to get hurt. <laughs> That's a good idea too soon. So anyway, um, we we go out there and three of us decide we're going to get this branch down so we can have the whole area again. We can mow better around it. Well, so Richard and um, can mow better around it. And uh, so we we get out there and we cut off the end of it and and all the little stuff on the end, no big deal. And then, and, and that shifted a little bit. And when it did, we cracked a little bit on the branch. And then we cut off a middle section that was much heavier uh, to where what we left was about 10 inches in diameter. And then the part that connected the tree was about 24 inches in diameter, a huge branch, 20, 30 feet long. And, and the brilliant idea I had was, you know, if we can just get the end to pull out the weight of that thing, this 2,000 pound branch should bring it down on its own. Then we can just cut it up and carry it off. That shouldn't be a problem. So I run around to the end and I pick up the end of this branch and, and this huge branch that it worked. <laughs> It worked. When I lifted it up and I took one step back with the branch, I heard crack and the the part connected to the tree snapped and I watched it as it began to fall. And as it was falling, I had enough time to think this through. The heavy end was the part by by the tree. The light end was the part I was carrying and the branch was swooped like this so it turned into a teeter totter. And I was the little kid with the 350 pound dad on the other end as that end went down and this end recoiled back and it lunged at me. Thank goodness I was able to get back. It didn't come up through me, but it lunged at me and hit me in the face, went through my lip, six stitches, 10 stitches, six stitches to put my lip back together and then four stitches to put my lip back against my gum line. I just, I'm proud to say I can take a hit evidently because I just did like this and never went to the ground and I just, I will not go into too much detail, but was spitting things out. Uh, not teeth, thank goodness, but uh, lots of blood. And, and finally I stood up and my friends that were there working with me said, um, you're probably going to need to go get some stitches. And I said, oh really? I said, I can't feel it, so I don't know what's going on. And uh, they said, let us take you to the hospital. I said, no, I'm fine. I'm going to call Cindy on my way to the truck. And so I call Cindy as I'm walking to the truck. And, and she says, I said, I don't want you to freak out, but there's been a little accident. I've been caught in a little accident. And, um, and she said, send me a picture. And um, so I take a selfie picture, uh, the worst selfie I've ever done, and, um, and send it to her. And she said, you need to let them take you to the hospital. I said, I'm already almost to the truck. I'm just going to drive myself. She said, let William come get you and take you to the hospital. I said, no, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'm getting in the truck. I'll be fine. And she said, let me come get you. And I said, no, you're already right there by the hospital. Just go over and wait for me. And so I get in the truck. I get on the interstate. I call Jeremy. It's Saturday morning, about 930. I said, you're up. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to send you over notes and, uh, and I'm on, my, on the interstate on the way to the hospital. And he said, great, I'm, I'm ready. Um, just, um, I'm glad to do that. And so uh, I get to the hospital and just before I get to the hospital, I turn on the medical drive there off of Edwards Lake Road. And I've got about two minutes to go before I pull into the emergency room parking lot. And, and I felt it. I came out of shock. And I thought, oh my word, 
I'm, I'm going to black out driving. And about that time, Cindy called. She said, hey, how are you? And I said, I'm not, not, not great. And um, she talked me, got me there to the hospital parking lot. I pull in. And I've been to the hospital to visit many of you many times. And it's always packed and people waiting in cars because there aren't even enough rooms in the, the emergency department. I walk in, one person was in the waiting room at the emergency department on a Saturday morning at 930. Walk in, lay down immediately. It was either lay down or fall down. So I lay down. And 60 seconds later, they're wheeling me back and beginning to work on putting my face back together. And um, so they squirt this stuff uh, to, to deaden before they stick the needle in me to deaden to do the stitches. And, and I said, hey, doc, just so you know, when you squirted that, um, I tasted it when you just squirted from the outside. And uh, there was a hole through. And so I'm praising God and thanking God. If you've got a strong stomach and a desire to know more, you can see the pictures on Facebook. And that's the end of that story. Every day, it's miraculous. If it would have been two millimeters further in, I would have lost my teeth. If it would have been two inches lower, it would have crushed my jaw or, or, or worse. If it would have been two inches higher, nose and eyes and all that. So uh, thank you for your prayers. Um, so here's what I want to begin by saying today. Being in membership will not call, keep you from going through it whatever it may be. But being in membership will keep you from going through it alone. It was scary what happened that Saturday. But, but it was not nearly as scary because I had other people looking out for me right alongside of me. And a wife who was talking me through getting to the hospital and a, a pastor who shows up at the hospital to check on me while I'm there. I, I do remember that, Jeremy, that's good. Uh, we're in a membership, we're in a body, we're in a people that we walk through it together when it happens. And so today I want to give you very quickly three things that I, I think we have to answer that are very important that moves us from, from being just spectators or people that are just taking um, things as consumers to becoming contributors. Godly commitment and membership moves us from being consumers to being contributors you see, there's a, there's a great phrase that is put on most of our coinage is over the, the chambers of the Senate and the House. It's on most of, many of our state flags, and it's e pluribus unum, from many, from, one, from many one. There are many parts. There are many of us that are, make up different parts of this body, but we are one together. This motto appears on the American coins, uh, on the tribune of the U.S. Senate. On the motto appears on the flags of uh, the House of Representatives uh, and the Senate. The motto appears on the service mark for the U.S. Army. It shows up in many states' flags, organizations, coats of arms, schools around the world. It, it, it goes back to the beginning of our nation and even before. Out of many, one. Out of many, one. And so the question that this scripture today, I believe, begs of us is why, your first blank, why should I be in membership? Why? Here again, verses four and five of Romans 12. For as in one body, we have many members and the members do not all have the same function. So though many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, you see, almost every time you find the word church in scripture, it shows up not as a person, but it, and, or even describing a building, it refers to the visible single congregation that meets at a certain location. I mean, think about this. Most of Paul's letters were written to the church in, the church in Corinth, the church in Galatia, the church in Ephesus, the church in Philippi, the church in Colossus, the church in Thessaloniki. That one's a little tougher to say today. And the church in Rome. You see, when, when Paul's writing these letters to the church, he's writing to a, a single entity, a gathering of people, a body of people that are going through it. But they're not going through it alone. You see, we, we join and become a part of the church because we know that with, without being a, a part of something bigger than ourselves, we are all in danger. It's as though we're an organ of the body without a body. It's as though we're a sheep without a flock. It's as though we're a child without a family. In Ephesians 2, 19, it says this, so then you are no longer strangers or aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You see, joining a church makes a visible commitment to Christ and Christ's people in a body. 
The human body is amazing, but it changes quickly. But the body of Christ is even more amazing, and it, friends, is eternal. It is what we're called to be united in and a part of the saints who've gone on before us and those who will come after us. And we're all connected in this body of Christ. The church is not an organization, but it is an organism. The church is not a building, but it is a body. The church is Christ's body and the body only works when the parts are healthy and connected. So let's say today that you go, all right, I get it, Vaughn, that's fine. I understand that it's good to be a part of a body. It's good to be a member of a church, but where, your next question today, your next blank today, where should I be in membership? Where should I be in membership? Here, verses six through eight. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith, in service, in our serving, in the one who teaches, in teaching, and the one who exhorts in exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. You see, joining a church makes a powerful statement, a statement and a commitment in a world that avoids both. We live in a world that often doesn't want to be committed. We're all, always fearful of the, the call that's trying to sell us some more um, insurance or a car warranty or help us with our credit card debt or join in with um, Camp Lejeune uh, lawsuit. And we, we all feel like we're being sold on something and, and we're, we're avoiding of that. We're frustrated with that. But let me just tell you, joining and being a member of Christ's holy church is so important for us. Because life happens, it happens. And when it happens, it doesn't mean that we keep from having it happen. It just means that we won't ever go through it alone. I, I promise you, the, the, one of the dumber things I've done recently is drive to the hospital alone. Ah, uh, there you go, I knew it was coming. Yeah. It was dumb. We're not meant to do our pain alone, our joy alone, our successes alone, our struggles alone. We're meant to do it in community so that when the weight of it falls down on us, it literally, we're not fearful of passing out and being the only one in charge. We're, we are our brother's keeper. We look out for each other. We come alongside of each other. We, as, as choosing where we are members of Christ's body. We have to remember that we're called to be a Jesus-loving, people-serving, warm-hearted, Bible-believing, outwardly-focused group of fellow servants. And if that be true, let me be really clear, if that be true, the denominational flag is very secondary. I tell people all the time, students of mine, I have several thousand students in my first 10 years of ministry that were in those youth groups and they'll call and say, uh, we're not really going to, uh, we've, my wife or son, her husband and I, we've had a child, we've moved to a new city and we're looking for a place to connect and, and they'll say, but we're not going to a Methodist church, is that okay? I say, are they preaching Jesus? Are they teaching Jesus? Are they lifting up Jesus? Are you being challenged to be in his word? Are you having a group that comes around you and alongside of you? Then I'll say to them what I would say to you, if, if we are indeed a Bible-believing, Jesus-teaching, people-loving, warm-hearted group of people that are serving in the world, the denominational flag should always be lower than the Bible flag and the Christ flag. It should be the highest allegiance we carry in our lives. Now, I am proud to be a traditional Wesleyan Methodist pastor, but the highest flag will always be raising um, in this family is the banner of Christ proclaimed in Scripture. One of my favorite statements to say to people every month is welcome home. Some of you have heard this recently in our midst. Welcome home, we've been praying for you, waiting for you, and trusting that some of the ministry God is leading us to do would not happen until you got here. So let's get going and let's trust God to bring it to be. Many years ago, uh, one of my favorite preachers um, was uh, joining a, a little church in Philadelphia. That the congregation there watched as three little nine-year-old boys were baptized and joined the church. Not long after, uh, because of dwindling membership, that church sold and the building was disbanded. And one of those three boys was Tony Campolo. 
incredible, incredible pre preacher, theologian, sociologist, professor at Eastern College in Pennsylvania. And he became an author. And years later, he decided to go back and, and, and look at the roles for that disbanded church and see what they recorded as having happened that year in the life of the church. And he tells the story, and I want to use his exact words. Years later, when I was doing research in the archives of our denomination, I decided to look up the church report for the year of my baptism. And there was my name. And Dick White's. He's now a missionary. And Bert Newman, now a professor of theology at an African seminary, was also there. And then I read the church's report for that year, the year that the three of us were baptized on the same day. And it read like this. It's not been a good year for our church. We've lost 27 members. Three joined and they were only children. Now, let's be clear, he says. Now, not everyone who is baptized grows, to be up, grows up to be a Tony Campolo or a seminary professor like Bert Newman. And while he might, uh, we might not all go on the mission field like Dick White, uh, but we all have become missionaries through the waters of baptism. That the water is the water of life. It changes everything. It cleans us up. It gives us a starting over point, And it reminds us just how much we are loved. And all we're asked to do is drink from this water of life. You see, friends, Mark's gospel starts with these words, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I actually love that, that he refers to his version of the story of Jesus that way, as he says, this is the beginning of the gospel of Christ. It tells me everything I need to know about baptism as the beginning of our life in Christ. Now, what we would believe as Wesleyans is that there's prevenient grace that's been working all along. There's justifying grace where we make this profession of faith and this sanctifying grace that keeps working. But in, in, in a very real sense, every time we celebrate people joining and people giving their heart to Jesus and people professing faith in, through the waters of baptism, joining into the family of God, let's just simply say this. It's our chance to say the beginning of the story of Jesus in us. Let's say you felt convicted to, to be in membership. You got over the, the, the desire not to commit but you felt convicted it's time to be a membership and you felt like this is the place to do so. I think there's still a third blank and a third question you've got to, we need to answer and wrestle with together. So the first is why membership. The second is where membership. And the third blank and the final blank today is how should I be in membership? How should I be? Here are verses nine through 11. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly or sisterly affection. I'll do one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, but be fervent in spirit and serve the Lord. You see, what does commitment to genuine love, holding to good, loving one another, outdoing each other in honor and zealous, fervent serving of the Lord look like? I'm really glad you asked. Because <laughs> we have a really simple way of answering that here at Clear Branch. So it's we commit to five things. When every person joins, first is, do you profess Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Put your whole trust in him and him alone for salvation. And then after that, I do, that's joining the church universal, holy and Catholic around the world. And then the second question is, will you join us as we together use our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness for the bringing of the kingdom of God and the furthering of the cause of Christ? We ask these two questions for a very important reason. The first is, we want to make sure you're a part of the whole of the church, Christ's body, Christ's church. And then the second is joining locally into this part of the body of Christ. And what it means for us to be the eye or the ear or the nose or the mouth or, well, as we used to sing as kids, head, shoulders, knees, or toes, right? That eyes or ears or mouth or nose. We want to be a part, I do the part in Christ's body that we're called to. And so I want to unpack just really quickly with you what these five things mean. Prayers, that we commit to pray. We're walking through a discernment process as a church right now in preparation for a vote on November 21st at 7 p.m. in this room, Monday night of Thanksgiving week. It will probably contain two of the most important votes in the history of this church. And I wanna challenge every one of you to be here as a part of that and to be praying between here and there for that. We have a prayer calendar that you can be a part of that we're lifting this process up every day. The second is presence, that we commit to be here. 
And when we can't be here in the room, we commit to being a part of our online campus that we're always delighted to have those that are either sick at home or on vacation or in other places. We are committed to being a part of this body, being present. You know, they, they say that children can, they spell love with four letters, but it's not L-O-V-E, it's T-I-M-E. That we spend our time, this valuable resource of time, that we, we commit to the ministry of presence. The third is gifts. And we'll spend more time on this next week as we talk about stewardship. The gift is to commit to give proportionally and consistently. Why? Because scripture tells us that where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. And where your treasure is, your heart will be also. They're, they're linked, they're tied together. We don't just want you to be faithful in your giving so that we can pay the bills and keep lights on and staff and missions and ministries taking place that we're, we want to be about. But we really want you to be faithful in your giving because it's good for your soul. It's not just what we want from you, it's what we want for you. Friends, I, I meet people all the time, you know, Jeremy, even today as you were talking about the offering and here goes the preacher talking about offering stuff again. Now, this matters. That we can tell where our hearts are and where our passions are and where our priorities are by where we spend our things that are most precious. Our time, our money, our gifts, our passion. We'll cover that more in the next week or two. Number four, service. That we commit to serve others in ministry and mission together. Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to serve. I want to give a huge thank you to our church family that yesterday lavishly loved on 338 people that were here at Clear Branch. It was beautiful. I've gotten more calls, texts, private messages on Facebook from people that just said, man, the people of Clear Branch are overwhelmingly gracious and hospitable. And I should have done it at the end of our time together yesterday. So let, hear me today say thank you for representing Christ so well. From the band, to the tech, to the food, to the doors, the greetings, the golf carts and the parking lots, all of it. They were lavishly loved. Not only is that true in the ways that we have served together, but then I think about what happened in this place Thursday and Friday as well. I don't know that I've ever seen a greater outpouring of love than I saw Thursday night at, with a five-hour visitation. To love on the Abercrombie family that we adore. And, and, and then to come back on Friday morning and see an amazing service of celebrating Blake's, Blake's incredible life. And friends, when we do that, you are being the body of Christ. You are wrapping yourself around in a way that is visible and tangible to people as we walk through the valley of the shadow together. When, with the food that you signed up to bring, with the, the ways that we lavishly love, not only that, but I think about this very week, we got done with the event here yesterday and we still had like 96 uh, Chick-fil-A sandwiches and box lunches available. And uh, David Phillips and a team went down to deliver them to the homeless. They all got given out yesterday. And they'd already been there that morning loving on people too. Friends, when, and every Sunday when I walk out of worship and I see over at Missions Corner, this wonderful group of people that are preparing peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for Pinson Valley High School. We've been talking about that for a long time, but you know what? People are still hungry. And those wonderful folks that are doing that every Sunday would love for, if, if you as an individual or as a family or a small group want to just walk up and say, hey, we'll help today or we'll help next week, or whatever, they would love at Missions Corner to see you walk over and do that. I guarantee you to come alongside of and be a part of service. That's prayers, presence, gifts, service. Huge ways for us to represent Christ. And then finally is witness. You see, sheep make sheep better than shepherds make sheep. <laughs> Learned that long ago. Our staff and pastor's jobs are frankly, are not really for us to just go out and, and bring people into the church. It's for us to equip you, the laity, the body, the sheep of the, this flock, to equip you to reach your friends and your families and your neighbors and your coworkers and your teammates the people in your clubs and your groups and the people that you ride with on the bus, the people whose desk you walk by at work. We want to equip you to be able to reach them for Christ, to share the love of Christ with and to invite to be a part of this body. It's why we do so many big events because they're really, it's not just for us, the insiders. It's for us to be equipped to be able to share that with someone else. This week, we'll have our largest non-member event of the year. 
I'm not sure I'm thrilled about our largest non-member event of the year uh, being trunk or treat, but it is. Thousands of people will be looking for places to be with their children. Wednesday night this week, you have a chance to serve. Do a trunk, bring candy, serve hot dogs, and be a part of the hay rides and all the other festivities that will be happening this Wednesday night. And then on November 13th, it got mentioned this morning in the video that the church-wide picnic that we'll be doing at Sumatanga, it'll be a little chilly probably, but it's a great opportunity for you to invite someone to, to say, we're doing this wonderful experience. We'd love for you to be a part of that. Or November 20th, you can come and be a part of Deck the Halls. Or November 27th, 4th, 11th, and 18th of December, leading up to Christmas Eve. All of these are great opportunities for you to be a witness for Christ. To share the love of Christ and to invite people to be a part of what he's doing here. So hear me. Membership keeps us from going through it alone, but it doesn't keep us from going through it. Membership moves us from being consumers to being contributors. Membership has a calling, it has a place, and it has a purpose. Membership costs us much in this world, but it reminds us that being a member of Christ's holy church carries eternal gain, not temporary. The question remains, are you a full member of Christ's holy church? With your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. And I want to pray with you to that end right now. Would you bow your heads? Lord, today you have invited us to be full members of your body. And Lord, we would pray, e pluribus unum, that we would become one body out of our many parts. God, we have varied gifts and varied abilities, clearly some of us were not meant to be harborists <laughs> or tree cutters. But God, some are. We all have varying gifts that we can share with the world as a part of your body. We are called to commitment and to membership in a time when the world is repelled by the very term. Help us to have not only membership privileges, but as a part of your body to have membership priorities with how we use our time, talents, gifts, and resources. We confess that we are often conformed to the ways of this world more than transformed by being active parts of your body. Help us to run from disconnected apathy and run toward connectional passion. We long to be parts of your body, sheep of your fold, children of your family. Move us from being just consumers who take to being contributors who are constantly seeking ways to give. Remind us, Jesus, when you came, perhaps the best known verse in all the Bible, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave. God, that we would recognize that a part of showing our love is that we would be givers, contributors, members, committed to you and committed to each other. Forgive us for the ways and the times that we've lost sight of that. And inspire us, God, to be your body, redeemed by your blood. We ask all this in the name of the one who committed all of himself to us that we might commit ourselves to you. In the name and the power of Jesus, that God's people would say, amen and amen. We're gonna stand and sing this closing song. We're gonna go back to the song that we shared right before the message. And I would agree with Micah. This is your song. This is our song as the body of Christ, as the members of this household. And I invite you to sing it with all you got.